this video, I'm going to explore some of the learning objectives related to wave physics using the FET simulation wave on a string. A progressive wave is a wave that transfers energy. So a periodic disturbance oscillating through a medium is what sort of characterizes a wave. And so if I disturb this medium, this string here with this wrench, you can see that all the particles are disturbed. The energy of, of sort of the wrench shaking is transferred through the medium. All right? That's kind of what a wave is. And if I periodically disturb that, you can kind of see something that looks like a wave there. Now, this has a fixed end over here. When we study standing waves, as I mentioned a moment ago, that's going to be more important to sort of pin an end down. Let's just go ahead and change this. You could have a loose end, okay, where it's free to sort of move. So it's not pinned down, or we could just have no end, or we're just going to let the waves sort of fly out the window there. All right, imagine that's going to go on. So rather than me doing this manually, we can oscillate this, and so just have sort of a piston sort of moving this this way. So there's our periodic disturbance. We can see that the particles are moving up and down as the energy is transferred from left to right. So that's an example of a transverse wave where um, the particles are moving at right angles or perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. Now damping is sort of the energy losses that occur from left to right. So you see if there's lots of damping, then you've got uh, sort of the energy losses are going to be a lot. But if you've got no damping, then the sort of the energy that is in the wave here, the maximum displacement is sort of maintained sort of all the way through, right? So you still see sort of um, the same amplitude here, the maximum displacement of these particles, as you see initially. And so we won't worry so much about damping for this demonstration, but note that you can adjust that. And so if you had, um, like if you were splashing in a very muddy river bank, then the waves and sort of the, the mud wouldn't make it very far, right? Because there'd be a lot of damping in that substance. But if it's just sort of like water, you know, there's not going to be so much damping. So we'll leave it like that so we can see the full waveform. Um, characterizing waves or thinking about the wave properties, wavelength, period, frequency, velocity, amplitude, intensity, sort of all the important sort of wave properties. Let's take a look at measuring some of these things. And so if I put the wave in slow motion, it's maybe a bit more clear to see that the particles are moving just like this green dot up and down, but the energy is going left to right. All right, so like here's the, the crest right here, and then a moment later the crest is here, right? So the energy is moving this way, and the particles just sort of transfer that energy. We can read that the frequency is 1.5 hertz. And so frequency tells us the number of waves per second, right? How many waves per second? One of the tools that we get here is a timer. And so if we wanted to sort of start the the timer, and as the wave sort of propagates, we could count, you know, how many waves per second, okay, and that would be the frequency. It's like, start the wave right there, and that's one and a half, two waves, right? So you could count the number of waves in a given unit of time, and then by dividing them, right, the number of waves per unit time per second, that would be the frequency. And we find it's 1.5 hertz for this. If we have a higher frequency wave, again, this is in slow motion here. So the wavelength is shorter, so it's more frequently occurring. And if we were to time it, we'd count three waves per second. Okay, so three waves sort of oscillating in sort of a given block of time. The amplitude and the wavelength, we could determine from these rulers right here. So if I sort of pause the wave and I held my ruler up to sort of a convenient point to measure the wave, then from crest to crest, I can see that this wave is about 2.2 uh, centimeters of wavelength. The amplitude is the distance from equilibrium up to the crest. And so if I held sort of the zero here at equilibrium position, the dashed line, then I can see that this wave has an amplitude of 
less than 1, it tells me down here it's 0.75. And so you might sort of use your judgment and say, well, it's kind of somewhere kind of close to 0.8 maybe, but maybe not quite. And then if we increase the amplitude, we should see now an effect that this ruler at 1.25, so sort of somewhere in here, we should see that this piston is going up as high as that, and therefore with no damping, the energy just sort of being maintained. And, and so we should see the wave increase to this height. All right, let's see if that holds true. And indeed it does. And so that just sort of emphasizes what amplitude is. A common pitfall, a common mistake that students make with amplitude is they measure the entire height of the wave. So like from, from trough all the way up to crest, that's twice the amplitude. So it's okay to measure it that way if you say, okay, from the, from the trough of this wave up to the crest is 2.5 centimeters. And therefore half of that value or 1.25 is the amplitude. So as long as you cut the value in half, it's okay to measure this, this higher value, right? It's always gonna be a bigger um, value to measure from the crest to the trough because it's twice the amplitude. So you just have to divide it by two. And there may be more, there may be less uncertainty in the measurement because the way we determine percent uncertainty is the absolute uncertainty, which would be sort of the smallest division in this scale, two tenths of a centimeter, divided by the measured value. So by measuring a higher measured value, we're actually reducing the percent uncertainty in our measurement. So it may be better to actually measure from the trough to the crest, but only if you remember the definition that, that amplitude is only the distance from the undisturbed equilibrium position up to the um, maximum displacement, up to the crest, or from that position, undisturbed equilibrium position down to the trough either sort of one of those displacements, not the entire height of the wave, if you will, from crest to trough. So take care of that. <clears throat> reference line, so we can sort of move a reference line if we wanted to sort of put this somewhere to, to sort of compare something. Um, so that's a nice little tool to have. Tension, what's that going to do if we have high tension or low tension? So let's put the tension all the way to low and just sort of explore what this uh, simulation has to so we've got low tension. You can see now there's the particles aren't sort of as tightly bound to each other. So that's very low tension in the string. I'm going to put this on normal motion. So it's very high frequency, very high amplitude, very low tension with no damping. And you get this sort of almost uh, chaotic arrangement. If we put it in slow motion, you might see that it's a little bit more orderly there. There's some kind of a pattern to that. The wavelengths are kind of very, very small. Um, so to make it a bit more clear, put the frequency, frequency down to nothing. There's a low frequency wave with medium tension, normal speed, and that looks kind of like a wave there. So all the different wave properties, frequency times wavelength, gives the velocity, we can kind of see like we would calculate the velocity of this, or we could look at it in slow motion, obviously that would give us a slower velocity. Um, now here, I guess they've just sort of slowed it down, but the frequency is still this, so it's like this number times the wavelength always gives the velocity, they've just kind of artificially slowed it down, right? Um, but velocity is wavelength times frequency. Amplitude, we've covered that. Now, the intensity of the wave is sort of related to the energy in it. It's the power per cross-sectional area, and that's proportional to amplitude squared. So one of the things that we can measure on a wave is its amplitude, and then we can kind of realize mathematically that intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared. So just kind of keep that in mind. If we double the height of the wave, then we've quadrupled the intensity, or the power per unit area in the wave. Uh, likewise, if we half the amplitude, then we decrease the intensity by a factor of four, right? It's a fourth the um, intensity if the amplitude drops by a half because the intensity goes as the amplitude squared. So that's an important thing to keep in mind how the power per unit area, the intensity, is related to the maximum displacement of the particles on any point in the wave, the amplitude. Again, time period is something that you could measure or you could calculate from the inverse of the frequency. So 
let's sort of get all the physics we can out of this. Frequency is equal to one over the time period. The time period is the amount of time that it takes the wave to oscillate. And so it's also inversely related to frequency. Frequency is one over T and T is one over F. The time period of the wave is the number of seconds per wave. Number of seconds per wave. The frequency is the number of waves per second. And that's a convenient way to sort of think about those inversely related quantities. Frequency is measured in hertz or reciprocal seconds. Time is measured in seconds. Amplitude would be measured in a distance, centimeters or meters. Intensity is related to that, but it's measured in watts of power per square meter of area. And so it's saying how much power are we spreading out over a cross-sectional area? As waves propagate, they become weaker with distance because they're spreading their sort of energy out over a bigger and bigger area. And so the human perception of intensity um, for a sound wave, remember, is loudness. And the reason why it's quieter further away from a, a sort of a source of sound is because of this, is the wave is sort of spreading out over a greater and greater area. And so it's going to be sort of less powerful. So the distance from the source um, is related to the intensity that way, too. And so it's an inverse square. So the intensity tells us how many watts of power per square meter. And indeed, it gets weaker the further away you get. It's sort of like, um, because there is actual damping in the universe, right? And as we get further away, the wave isn't displaced as much. The amplitude is less. Let's make this normal now, right? So the amplitude is less over here, and so there's less energy. And so this actually does, you know, there, there is damping in the universe where um, the energy is spread out over a bigger and bigger area. This wave on a string is a nice simulation to just kind of explore the properties of waves and to do sort of some virtual measurements to give yourself a chance to measure what the wavelength of a given wave is, to sort of manipulate the frequency and to sort of explore those relationships that with higher frequency waves, I got shorter wavelengths. I can sort of prove that by quantifying it. Um, at low frequencies, I got longer wavelengths, you know, the given velocity and if this thing is moving more, right, there's more displacement, there's more kinetic energy, then it kind of makes sense why the amplitude of the wave is related to the power per sort of uh, square meter, um, the intensity, right? So more displacement, greater energy, more intensity. 